President, uh, fellow Rotarians, uh, it's my privilege to introduce our former President, um, who's uh, had a lot of involvement and uh, I think was the uh, uh, charity officer and pretty hard working, very hard working. Um, he's obviously dedicated, and he has to be, in his own business, which is in the music business. Um, he's also in um, the Orpheus Choir, and uh, I think uh, he's, he's not been prepared to tell me what the talk is about, <laughs> but um, I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. May I introduce ex-Rotarian? Ex <laughs> <laughs> Would say no. I will say you what a pleasure say. it is to uh, have an opportunity to get to club. It's been a, a long time since I've been able to find a space to be here, and so it's uh, really good to see you all. Uh, I think the last time I spoke uh, to you probably was um, about the trip we made to India and uh, and the connection uh, with polio. Uh, and I don't know whether you're getting updates on the current situation on the polio case count, but although I'm not really going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about that today, I thought it was an opportunity just to uh, slot in an update on that. So uh, just so you know, in 2010, there were 874 cases of polio worldwide, and this was down from <coughs> 1,503 in 2009. Um, and I never tire of trying to put this in perspective. In 1986, you'll recall when Rotary started on the polio eradication effort. That year, there were uh, around 365,000 cases in that year. So um, it's quite a reduction. Year to date, 2011, uh, 429 cases. Uh, compared to 706 in 2010, which is 40% down. Um, and I think the thing, given it was the country, the endemic country that we visited, the heartening thing for me was to see that it's now been more than eight months since the last case in India, which was in West Bengal in January. So um, that's really, really encouraging, I, I think. Um, that talk on India and polio, I actually was asked to deliver to other Rotary clubs and also some church groups around the place. Um, and earlier this year, one of the groups phoned me and said, w would I come and speak to them again? And, and I said, well, uh, not, not really, because I haven't been anywhere. I've been tied to my business and looking after the age of mothers and that sort of thing. I haven't really got anything I could talk to you about. So they seem to be, for some reason, keen to get me along. And I said, well, I suppose I could talk about my um, other passion in life, which is music. Um, and so with that agreed, I put down the phone. And I thought, crikey, what have I bitten off here? Because this is a bit of a vast subject. <coughs> so I thought, well, how can I tackle this? People spend years doing a degree and only covering a small part of the subject. So how can I cover it in a 20-minute talk? So I thought, well, I could talk about the science of music, um, how the human ear hears. Something has to vi vibrate to, for, for the human ear to hear the sound. So every musical instrument creates a vibration, whether it's the reeds on a saxophone, a clarinet, or an oboe, the strings on a, a, a violin family or a guitar, the player's lips with brass instruments, or the skin on a drum. Something has to vibrate to create that musical sound. And um, it's alleged, and I'll come back to the alleged in a minute, um, that Pythagoras it was who worked out um, that music is um, uh, the, the technical side of music, as it were, that it has a mathematics about it. Um, it's not just an art, but it's also um, a science. Um, and again, it's alleged that he worked this out because as he passed the blacksmith's shop every day and heard the blacksmith hitting his anvil, he realized that if the blacksmith used a hammer that was half the weight, you actually got the same note, but an octave higher. 
So when we hear um, an orchestra tuning up at the beginning of a proms concert or whatever, you hear the oboe player note, that note is um, the note A, or the note we call A, and that vibrates in, in Europe anyway, uh, we, we work at A equals 440 hertz, so that's the, the frequency it vibrates. If you double that frequency to 880, you get A an octave higher, so the same note an octave up. And if you halve it to 220, you get A an octave lower. Um, so um, there is this science about it. And I say allegedly because um, there is all sorts of stuff about Pythagoras not being a very nice bloke. Uh, and his real skill was noticing that his students had got a very good idea so he would nick it and see to them. Um, so how many of these ideas were actually Pythagoras and how many nicks is um, a moot point, I suppose. But I thought that wouldn't make a very interesting talk on, on its own. So I thought, well, I could talk about styles of music. But this is still a vast subject, even if we only looked at the last thousand years and started with monks chanting in the cloisters. Um, and came up to date with uh, the singer Adele, who's had the number one album for most of this year, it seems. It's about a thousand years worth, um, and, and that would take quite a bit of time as well. And, and the other problem is, if I try to narrow it down and say, well, I'll talk about this bit, um, then three quarters of you would nod off because you wouldn't be interested in that bit. So, um, so I thought, well, that isn't going to work either. So. Um, I decided that the, the way to approach it was um, to talk about um, what I've called the spiritual effect of music. Um, and I don't mean by that religious music, although that, of course, comes into it. Um, what I'm talking about is the power of, that music has to move us. Um, and then I realized that having decided to tackle it that way, the other ways would have been factual. I could give you facts about composers. I can give you facts about the science of music. But tackling it this way, there, there, there are very few facts, really. But nevertheless, I think hopefully it's, it's going to be interesting. Um, music has the capacity to um, lift us to um, great heights of, of joy, uh, and if our mood is wrong, to great depths of despair, I guess, as, as well. Um, it can take us back instantly to a time or a place where we first heard that, that music, or to a feeling that we had when we first heard that music. And what's interesting is man has put a a man on the moon, we've sent probes to Mars, we've done all kinds of things, and yet our understanding of the human brain is still relatively rudimentary, particularly in this area, because it seems no one can really understand or explain why one piece of music might move somebody, and the same piece of music leaves another totally cold. They don't understand what you see in it. Um, so, looking at it this way is fraught with difficulty, but let's go right back to um, the origins. Music is, uh, shall we say, very, very old, um, really goes back to the origin of our species. The archaeological record shows that Homo sapiens, us, or what the archaeologists call modern man, um, shared the planet at one time with other humanoid species, Neanderthals um, uh, in the north of Europe and, and Homo erectus elsewhere. It's not entirely understood why they died out and modern man, us, survived. Um, but it's thought that um, the social structure of modern man and our ability to work together and share ideas is at the root of it. Um, and for me it's interesting that when archaeologists find an ancient site, um, they have to decide which humanoid species it was that lived here. And the things they look for um, are evidence of decorative art, so cave paintings, jewellery, that kind of a thing. Um, religion, usually in the form of how did they treat their dead, 
Um, did they have a respect for, for the dead, that kind of thing. Um, or music, and they found very ancient sites, they found uh, little bone flutes and um, evidence they used drums and, and that kind of a thing. Um, and uh, it's interesting because none of those things of themselves would do anything to keep them warm in the winter or put food on the table as it were. Um, so they had people in their community doing stuff that really when you boil life down to its basics actually wasn't going to add anything really and yet they still did it. Um, so it's not clear why music, as I said, would give them the edge, other than um, it's evidence that they had these larger social networks. And certainly earlier in the, this year, I think it was, there was a program about Neanderthals um, that had yeah, uh, there were bigger that, species, they had a bigger brain. Um, but they, one of the professors interviewed said, if a Neanderthal had an idea that might improve the way they hunted, for example, um, it would stay with their family and die with them. Whereas if modern man had an idea, because of their social interaction and coming together, um, they would share the idea and modern man evolved mu much more efficiently because of it. And so they think that um, evidence of, of art and religion and music was evidence that, of them getting together in social networks and sharing ideas together. And scientists have said it's uh, the glue that holds people together, as indeed music does today in churches, choral societies, bands, orchestras, the proms, rock concerts. Um, the people who like those things have a, a common cause, as it were, that, that binds them together. So um, I think we could summarize that and say music is arguably one of the key things that define us as human. So if we come forward about 35,000 years to the current time, um, I'm struck how important uh, music is to the um, atmosphere, the depth, the excitement, the tension in a film. Um, without music, I would argue, most films would have none of those effects. Um, so music is crucially important to the, the effect a, a film has. And for that, well, that's one of the reasons why I'm really cross that it's almost one of the last things that's credited. Um, you know, if you watch the credits on a film, um, music comes below... Miss Lopez's hairstylist and the, um, and that sort of a thing, you know, the, the catering staff and, and things. Music's right at the bottom. Uh, and I'm particularly annoyed because it's wasted collectively hours of my life because a friend of mine, um, Simon Rhodes, um, he's actually senior sound engineer at Abbey Road Studios, but actually spends quite a lot of his life in Los Angeles, working with such people as um, John Williams, James Horner, um, and recording their music for films. So I sit there every film, waiting for the credits to roll to see if Simon was involved in, in this film. I've just connected with him on Facebook, so hopefully that'll save me hours, because I'll actually find out what he's up to. Um, we're not usually aware of the music particularly, but without it, the film wouldn't have the same effect. And what's interesting is um, that um, wherever a film is shown, all the way around the world, it seems not to matter what the cultural background or the taste of the audience is in, in music. Um, music that's creating a tension or creating a love scene or whatever has the same effect somehow, um, which, is, which is really odd, you, you would think. So, it's well understood that music has an ability to create a mood. And of course, that's been used to good effect for centuries, if not millennia. If we think about martial music, how it can encourage courage and patriotism in an army about to go to war. Imagine the massed Scots pipers coming at you over the hill. Scary, to say the least, I would think. Um, or music to get people dancing um, for celebrations and feasting. Um, creating feelings of happiness and, and joy. Um, 
what I mentioned earlier, the traditional chanting in church, which creates a sort of a certain reverence, a sense of awe in the presence of God, or the modern happy clappy church music that creates more of a feeling of Jesus is my best mate kind of a, a thing. Um, and those who set music for particularly for church services should be, and, uh, and the best ones often are aware of this ability to create mood or, or feelings. I think Billy Graham was quite a master at this, you know, the point he was calling people to respond to his call. Um, you know, he knew which pieces to put in there that would uh, crack the emotion and bring people forward. And, and I think there's a more modern example of that, the music that was chosen for the recent royal wedding. I think we can see that was designed to create a certain mood in the country and, and did it very well, has to be said. Um, so as we've said, music affects us, but it's not really known quite why. A lot of work is being undertaken uh, with music as a therapy, particularly for the mentally ill. Um, it's understood um, that there can be effect on unruly children, and I've actually, uh, customers um, who are teachers have tried this, and it actually works. Playing a piece of music, you know, things like Mozart all over quietly in the background, as children come into a class, um, they don't even need to hear it particularly, but it seems somehow to get them to settle to their lessons much more quickly. Um, there's studies being undertaken, particularly in Switzerland and the USA, on the effect of music, um, those children who have music lessons, and compared to those who don't, and their academic achievement. Those who have music lessons um, seem somehow to have the edge in other academic subjects. Uh, but again, it's not really understood quite why, although they're still working on that other than broad general generalizations about um, co ability to concentrate, um, hand-to-eye coordination, th those sorts of things. So, um, in concluding, let's look at what we've learned then. Um, as in all good sermons, I've got three. Um, firstly, music is and has been for tens of thousands of years central to what makes us human binds us together as a community, and that's given us considerable advantages as a species because it reinforces our willingness and our ability to work together. Uh, secondly, music has an ability to create in us or to change a mood even when we're not conscious of it. And thirdly, music lessons can have a positive effect on academic achievement in unrelated areas of study. I have, I'm afraid, and not really allowed in a Rotary Club, but nevertheless I'm going to go for it, I have a slightly political conclusion. Given what we've learned, I think we need to be concerned about the cutbacks that are falling on the arts generally, and especially, of course I would say this, wouldn't I, but especially music. Children who have, um, if children have no opportunity to have music lessons, who will be our musicians of tomorrow? Um, but arguably more important than that, without music, what are we? And I would say arguably less than human. Thank you. The first of your final points. Yes. Of music bringing people together. Yes. And what have you. I'm not entirely certain that that can always be said to be a good thing. It seems <laughs> to me that there are plenty of examples of music, in fact, bringing people together, yes, but not for the best of purposes. Uh, and one can think of some of the great political leaders who have led their people down roads which we would prefer yeah. not to have happened but uh, enforcing yeah. that with music, with martial music and the like. So, like everything else, um, uh, you know, it isn't always for the good. No. 
No, like all these things can be used both ways. And, um, and, and as I said, pe people who understand this have used it to very good effect. And Wagner, Wagner, the most favorite composer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wagner was fellow travel. Just a comment. Yeah. Um, when Natalie went to watch The Sound of Music some years ago, you remember there's a wedding near the end, she heard a child ask her mother, that's in front of her, Mummy, is a wedding always followed by a war? <laughs> yes. Arguably, yes. yes. <laughs> not necessarily. <not the> <laughs> Jim, no. I found your final statement rather puzzling. The words yeah. less than human. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, the point, the point was that... Um, How can you be less than human? Less as a human, but not less than. Well, yeah, I've, other, the other species didn't really show any evidence of having, having music. So it's one of, my point was, it's one of the things that defines us as being human. So, so without it, then arguably we're, we're less than human, aren't we? I think you could argue that the last 40 or so years have shown many, many people composing pop music who've had no formal music training at all. Indeed. Yeah. I mean, McCartney is one who acquired some subsequently, but uh, uh, well, I think music, in a sense, is a bit instinctive. Um, mm -hmm. Although we might yeah. worry about less formal training, people will always make music together, I think, uh, yes. one way or another. I hope that's the case, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Any other? Well, can I just ask, do you think that the type of music we enjoy reflects the state of society? Uh, I was wondering really about uh, some of the stuff that I uh, might hear at home, my son, some of these bands and such like, they called bands, but, you know, when you're at concerts and things, it, it's really not music I could, I can hang a hat and say that's music, it's a noise, but uh, do you think that, yeah, yeah, but you said music to enjoy. Mm. Yeah, well, we I mean, don't I, enjoy it, do we? Yeah, no. <laughs> well, I've often, I've often enjoy, wondered, enjoy. And, and I don't know if we know the answer to this, but what did, what did the people of the time think <coughs> to Beethoven, for example? Um, you know, did they think what he wrote was absolutely outrageous? <laughs> and my God, it's um, you know everything's well, going to the, the wall. And, half and the and populace wouldn't have known because they had no means yeah. of, of transmitting that yeah. music. Yeah. 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 Nationwide. Music, of course, was the rich, really. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, except dance music. You know. No, I'm going back a few centuries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the music. Oh, is the question. Why did I mean, it may be wrong, but I, 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 in my, I believe that the people in Southeast Asia can appreciate Western music much more than the people of Europe can appreciate yeah. Asian music. Yeah. And the tone, tone music yeah, that comes out of China and Japan. <coughs> and yeah. why, why, why would that be? Um, the, the, they use the pentatonic scale a, a lot, which is it's essentially the black notes on the piano. Um, and we, we tend not to use that much. So it, it sounds very alien to, to us. Why? It should not be the same the other way around, I'm not entirely sure, unless um, in, in the current climate that, that they have access to a lot of Western music, whereas we probably have very little access to theirs. Uh, so I guess it's, it could be a f familiarity thing, I, I don't know. I mean, I've often argued, um, and we, I bow to our, our linguist here, but I often feel that um, students in France and Germany, Spain, learning English have a bit of an advantage over our children here because they would hear English all the time in, in the pop songs and that sort of a thing. Um, so they're getting um, in English, they're absorbing it outside of their lessons, whereas our children would rarely, if ever, hear French or German or Spanish um, outside of the, the, the classroom, really, unless they go to the, to the countries in question. And so it is a, probably a question of familiarity, I, I, I guess, I, I, I don't know.
Can I make a comment, Mr. President? Mm -hmm. Another question. Sure. Um, <coughs> my, my head of music uh, many years ago now, actually, was very keen on opera, and we produced uh, a, a number of operas. Um, the, I think the most difficult of which uh, was the Barber of Seville, in which I had the uh, very dubious honour of playing the part of Dr. Bartolo. And at the end, the last night, uh, we were all lined up for the final, the big finale, when everybody's on, and, you know, and uh, as a little uh, first form girl, I think, or second form girl, standing in front of me, and uh, she, she sort of, while we were she sort of turned and said, oh, isn't it awful, this is the last night. And I said, well, have you enjoyed it? She said, yes, it's been marvellous. She said, I don't know what I'm going to do now without all the rehearsals and the practices. And, uh, and I said, well, has it been worthwhile, you think? And she said, oh, yes, she said. Uh, I said, is it better than sport? And she said, oh, yes, she said, in sport, you're all trying to do each other down. But in this opera, we've all been helping, helping one another. We've been singing each other's parts. And if anyone has hesitated, we've always come in and helped them. And I thought, well, that's the peak of my academic career. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I was a teacher. I'm glad I was a headmaster. Just one child has learned that. Yeah, and yeah. that bears out what you said, Colin. Yeah. Thank you, George. But, uh, yeah. All I was going to say, Colin, music has only become the uh, theme of the populace over the last 80 or 90 years since the radio was invented. Yeah. Where, I mean, not a lot of people, I don't suppose, prior to that time went to concerts. <laughs> But once they got on to the 20s, with the, with if you like the bands of the of the of the 20s, and that that's when music became more popular with with the populations, and therefore that's what brought about, I think, the, if you like, revolutionaries in, in music. Yeah, there was folk music going back. Centuries. Yeah, but it yeah. didn't go to didn't get out to the the, the population as such because they had no means of communication. For it, until the radio came into being. Parts passed down by rates. I mean, uh, it's my field, isn't it? Um, the, the, the folk music was going on all the time. Oh, yeah. The classical music was going on. In yeah. fact, it was classical music uh, in these uh, later centuries that drew upon folk music to bring into classical music. So it was going on. Oh, it was going on, but not the population as such. No, didn't they hear it because the they had no music. weren't they? You're talking about organised music in the sense of big orchestras. Well, I'm talking about the population being able to listen to music. They, not, I wouldn't have thought the majority of the population actually went... They would have heard it locally. I wouldn't have thought many of them went and attended music as such. They'd have dances and that kind of thing. Well, I wrote down here, uh, as I was making um, some... Uh, uh, notes, uh, I thought it was rather appropriate that I have to give them other things. <laughs> well, thank you that. Key, yeah, um, yeah. I, I, thought, I could comment on that, I could comment on that, no, shut up, because we've had the talk, um, and it, it, it is important. I, I, I love John's little anecdote there, because I've had that um, with kids coming up to me years after they're, I'm teaching their kids and say, You got me interested in music, you made me sing in HMS Pinafore. And I never forget it. You came round and said, "You can you sing? Yeah, right. You're going to be in my." <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And mm -hmm. I loved it ever since. Well, mm -hmm. I know you're the same again. <laughs> you do that with your literature. You're going to read. Anyway, um, can I just hark back to something that Colin said right at the beginning of his talk, and that is to do with the polio. Um, and, and Jeff mentioned about the bottles. And you may think, oh God, you know, that's got to go to the foundation. Da, 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 da. Well, um, this money, if all the clubs do send this money into the foundation through, through the club, it, it will help us to, uh, to meet the target that we need to, to meet. On, uh, we are on course to do this, the, uh, of the Bill Gates Challenge. <coughs> he threw it out three years ago. If you can match me, I can't remember the figures, got in uh, so many million. Um, Dollars. If you can match me, I will give toward, uh, so many million dollars towards the eradication of polio. And as the speakers and the top bots said at the various conferences, we're that close to doing it, that close to getting the money, and that close to sort of uh, getting rid of polio. So please, please, please support this bottle idea um, with as much as you can put in, uh, put in with um, loose change or whatever. But coming back to your talk, Colin, um, it, 
summed it up very well. I'm glad when you said about the history, I thought, God, it'll be for here for hours if you talk about the whole of history. Uh, but summarising it in the way you did and the way it makes you feel, uh, and it makes us all feel different. Um, I just think that that was a, a, a wonderful summary. Um, it does create moods. It does uh, bring you up, bring you down. Um, I like things that you don't like and vice versa. And, and we're all different, but it does have a, a great uh, effect on people's lives. So thank you so much for talking to us today. It's yeah, lovely yeah, to see you. Yeah, yeah, very good. And with that, uh, gentlemen, if I could remind you of the uh, Apologies book, the menu we, uh, we haven't had it yet, is uh, Shepherd's Pie with Savoy cabbage. Um, the uh, dessert is whiskey, no, whiskey orange, uh, <laughs> plus oatmeal full. Whiskey. No. Whiskey, orange, plus and oatmeal full. And oatmeal full. Yeah, of course. They wave the bottle over the oatmeal and that's it. And you made the full. <coughs> so uh, that's the menu. Can I remind you of the website, please? Uh, lots of new photographs, lots of new information on there. And if you'd like to be upstanding for the final toast. Mr. President, can I bring up your...